All right, Matthew chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And may we hear the inspired word of the living God. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born, king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. May God add, may God add his blessing to the reading and understanding of that portion of his holy scripture. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, what a joy it is to welcome for the fourth time in the last two years back to Epworth United Methodist Church, Bishop Will Willeman. This is, however, the first time he has been with us in person. You remember Palm Sunday, he was here, preached at all services virtually, and he has been with us on a couple of other occasions, but we're so thankful to have him here in person. I was telling him last night as we were reflecting about the long time that we've known each other, I said, you know, you really, you really are the most well-known and impactful United Methodist leader worldwide. There's just not even anybody at close second. Um, he took that with his usual charm and humility, but the fact of the matter is his books, his writings, his, uh, his sermons continue to impact the world every single day. He has preached the greatest pulpits in America from the Crystal Cathedral in Garden Grove, California to Marble Collegiate Church in Manhattan and everything in between Yale University. For 20 years, he was the Dean of the Chapel at Duke University, became a United Methodist Bishop, and now is back at Duke as the Director of Doctoral Studies, the Dean of Doctoral Studies, and uh, Professor of the Practice of Christian Ministry. Um, well, I, he has just been an important part of my life and my ministry throughout uh, the very beginning. Uh, when my father passed away suddenly and unexpectedly last Thanksgiving a year ago, he was the person I called to speak at the service. That gives you an idea of our relationship. Would you help me give, please, for the third time today, a very big Epworth welcome to Bishop Will Willeman. It's wonderful to be among you at this church that is going through such a marvelous uh, renewal and renaissance, leading the way in our denomination. Uh, the children have reminded us that the Matthew begins the story of Jesus, not with uh, Jesus, uh, but with these wise men that came from the east and visited at the manger. They're not called wise men, they're called magi. Uh, it's where we get our word magic from, magician. They were stargazers, astrologers, probably how they saw the star in the east. They're not Jews. They don't have scripture. All they have is a kind of feeling that something must be happening. They see the star. They come to the manger and they just spontaneously lay out gifts for the baby, improbable gifts. What is a baby going to do with the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh? I, uh, and they worship. And, and it's unusual because these Gentiles, these non-believers are the first to worship. And in that sense, 
They're the first of, of all of you. There's, there's some here this morning. You don't know much scripture. Uh, maybe you are not uh, sure of why you're here. You, you, maybe you are not sure about what you believe, don't believe. And, I, and yet there you are engaging in a, a strange activity that defines who Christians are as opposed to the world. Worship. You join those magi in worship. And there's a sense in which of, of all the countercultural different things the church does, there's a sense in which in the present cultural context, worship may be one of the, the most <laughs> unique. Uh, we, I wonder, do we live in a world where the wonder that is worship has, has become strange? The modern world looks at you as you show up here on Sunday morning and it seems strange. You're singing music that you, you don't hear on the radio. You, you're in this building that is bigger than it needs to be, uh, more elegant, beautiful than it has to be. You're, you're singing, even though you may not be a professional musician. What is all that about? And behind that is the modern world's question that it puts to all experiences and relationships and events. What good does that do me? Will it fold out into a bed? Can you dice chew again fries with it? Can you list it on eBay and make some money out of it? We judge everything on the basis of its utility, its practicality. But worship, the falling to your knees, awestruck wonder, the tear that goes down your cheek involuntarily, that amen that you find yourself uttering, that aha, that's, uh, that's different. Uh, and there's something about the modern world that, that makes more odd what you do here on a regular basis. The modern world is dedicated to explanation, explication. Uh, you got to remember back, there used to be a time you looked up into the starry night on a summer sky and you saw all those stars arrayed before you and maybe you said, wow. But now you look up and you're just seeing the planets go in their predictable courses. You're, you know that the stars, it's just a chemical reaction that we're seeing a million years later and uh, that happens in the modern world where it's emptied of transcendence and, and mystery. And yet, maybe something about you tells you there's more. There's more going on in the world, and there's more going on in you than you've been allowed to explore. I remember I asked a Duke undergraduate, why do you come to Duke Chapel on such a regular basis? And she said, I like coming to church because you get to talk about stuff that you're prohibited from talking about in the classroom. Uh, you, you get to experience more of yourself than you're allowed to experience in the rest of the world. I think that kind of gets it right. Uh, and it's... I'm saying that that's kind of hard for modern people. One of the words that we use to define ourselves at worship is the word ecstasy. We're in ecstasy. And the, the, that word comes right from the Greek. Uh, ecstasis means literally ex, outside, stasis, stand. It means literally to stand outside yourself. And I can't think of anything that is much more difficult for modern, rational, 
analytical people to do, then just for a moment to stand outside yourself. Not to worry about what other people are thinking about you. Not to say, how do I look? How am I doing? What am I getting out of this? But to just be in ecstasy. To be, in the words of Charles Wesley in his hymn, lost in wonder, love, and praise. That's a, a different kind of phenomenon for most of us. And I'm wondering if, if that's one reason you're here. Maybe like the Magi, you, you've been attracted to some light. You're curious. You want to venture out in that unknown area that the modern world keeps us from. Years ago, Morton Kelsey did a study of Roman Catholic lay people and found out in interviews that the average Roman Catholic had had at least one mystical, life-changing, spiritual experience. And we followed up on that. He found out the average person, having had such an experience, replies, and I've never told anyone about it. Why? The next response, they would think I was crazy. That's a fairly severe judgment to put on people's experiences. And Kelsey said there's like this policing going on in the modern world to make sure that you don't hear any voices that are not exclusively self-derived. To make sure that nothing gets to you from the outside that everything you think and you feel comes from within you. Maybe, in a sense, you're rebelling against that. You're here. You're here listening for a word that doesn't come out of you but comes to you. You're exploring an area of your life and reality that's unavailable to you otherwise. Or oh, the world says, oh, you Christians, you just escape the reality of the world. You, you come inside there to this unreal world of worship. Maybe. Worship is not an escape from reality, but a risky, wonderful probing of a deeper reality you don't get to approach in most of your life. And in such moments, maybe that's the key to life. Many of you are here, I bet, because there have been those moments, maybe not every Sunday, but those moments when you weren't thinking about God, you weren't looking for God, you weren't asking for God. You, you weren't in the right frame of mind. You had other things you could have been doing and were thinking about doing. And then during the service, what was it? A, a line from the sermon or maybe something, a, 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 a hymn that was sung or just being with sisters and brothers in Christ. I, something. And an involuntary tear came down your cheek. Or you found yourself moved, lost in wonder, love, and praise that was really, in a sense, being found. I, if you notice, the, the wise men came to the manger and they, they saw this baby and they just fell to their knees. They worshiped. They responded. They responded to this wonder uh, of God with us of God caring so much about us that God didn't wait for us to come to God. God would wait a long time for that. But rather God came to us. Emmanuel, God with us. God showing up. 
because we couldn't show up to God. That's, that's worship. And, and I, is this hard, maybe, for, maybe particularly for Methodist Christians? Sometimes I think of our image of us on Sunday morning is, we come to church to get our assignments for the week. Okay, this week, church, I want you to work on your sexism and your racism and be nice to sales clerks and department stores and, and recycle, and then come back next week and I'll give you another assignment. No wonder a lot of you, you know, you look more tired when you leave than when you arrived. And, and uh, no, worship is, is that experience, responsiveness, reflexiveness to wonder that comes among us. Maybe we're wrong to think of worship as something we do. I go to worship and I sing and I do this and I do that and I listen. And I... Maybe worship is best thought of as something that God does in us. It's a gift given out of love. And, you know, people in love do some weird things. If you've ever been in love you can testify you did some weird things like writing poems even when you're not a poet and singing songs even when you're not a great musician and sitting through an NFL football game even though you know nothing about a first down and, and going to a concert even when you think Beethoven is a movie about a dog. I mean, you, you do weird things when you're, you do it out of love. Or as First John says, why, why do we do what we love? Because he first loved us. It, it's responsive. What good does that do? It's, it's kind of the wrong question. Maybe a better question is, I wonder what good God is doing in us uh, through this experience of Wonderful worship. And maybe you're here because you, you have, you don't know everything about the Christian faith and you got questions and everything, but you know enough to know that somehow making contact with that reality that is normally unavailable to you in everyday life, that making contact with that reality is the key to everything. Uh... When I was a student, I participated in the civil rights movement to a small degree. A group of us students went to a little AME church in Low Country, South Carolina. We were the only white people there in the service. We, we got there about seven. They were already singing. And then about eight o'clock, they were still singing. Nine o'clock, still singing, singing, singing hymns that we didn't sing in our churches. Well, about 9.30, I said to our host, hey, um, when are we going to get organized? When are we going to get ready to, for the protest tomorrow? And he said, son, we've been at this a lot longer than you have. And we have found that when you get out there tomorrow with those police dogs and people yelling hateful things at you, you better have more backing you up than simply a desire to help other people. You better know who God is and what God is up to. And I would submit to you that that's kind of the point of Sunday. The questions on the table before us, who is God? What is God up to? And a third, how can we be part of that? And, and I wonder if that was on the faces of those wondering magi as they knelt before the manger. Well, God is not some impersonal distant force. God is with us. Emmanuel, on our side, for us, rather than against us. When that, when that hits you, you, it just, all you can do is just 
Amen? Uh, wow. And that may be the good that you need most doing in your life. I came out of church a couple of weeks ago, and there was a woman there I recognized. I knew her. Uh, she has been gone. She has gone through a tough time, not only in the middle of the pandemic with a family, but she got a terrible diagnosis of an illness in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, Two weeks after her diagnosis, her husband walked out on her and left her with two children. One of her children got problems with addiction. Well, I saw her and I just immediately thought of the huge burdens she is under and the difficulties of her life. She was coming out of church and I said to her, hi, how are you? She turned around and said, wasn't that wonderful? And I thought, wow, that's amazing. With all you got on you and all the different, to say that was wonderful. I wonder what was wonderful about it. And I asked her, I said, well, what, what, what was it that you found wonderful, helpful? And she said, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I just felt myself swept up in something bigger than me. I just felt for a moment, wow. There's more going on than the troubles I've got in front of me. It just felt reassuring to know. I think she went home another way than the way she had come. Just like those magi lost in wonder, love, praise. And thank God for most days, that's enough. <laughs>